Mm. So before we do the Amita, I want to say a few words and. Um, well, that's, I don't know that microphone thing. And we'll deepen into our prayers. I started out by saying, let's begin big, but let's continue big because we're already whew, strong. We're strong tonight. We can feel the power. Big, big, as in the vastness of space, as in the fact that at this very moment, my friends, at this very moment, we're spinning on a tiny planet through space, so voluminous that it silences the mind. Picture it, picture it, our beautiful yet middling planet orbiting a bright star, a pinpoint, a pinpoint of light in a vast galaxy, and our beautiful galaxy, the Milky Way, is, the only, is only one of 200 billion galaxies, billion galaxies in the observable, observable universe with super clusters and sextillions of stars far vaster and bigger than we. We don't often allow our minds to travel into space to ponder these things, but it feels right on this night, on this most sacred and starry night of Yom Kippur, to remember that here on our tiny blue planet, our tiny blue dot out in space, we are spinning at just the right speed, at just the right temperature, on just the right tilt of our axis, at just the right distance from our source of light and warmth to allow us to be here tonight. This is a cosmic design of a cosmic intelligence with a cosmic sense of humor that chose to evolve so many species on our planet and our own two-legged species with a strange protuberance in the center of its face. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> and a nervous system, a brain, lingual capacities, and the ability to look out at the universe and go, oh, wow, to take another person's hand and say, ah. This whole enterprise began, the Kabbalists taught, just as the physicists alike tell us, 14 billion years ago when the cosmic consciousness, AKA, also known as Elohim, announced, Yehi or, let there be light, and matter and antimatter, space and time collided and exploded in a huge big bang. And our universe was born, and from that moment on, it has never ceased to expand, pushing into the limits of infinity. So on this powerful night, Kol Nidre night, full of ancient spirit, let's allow ourselves for just a few minutes to feel the enormity, the enormity of the power and the sheer intelligence that called us into being with the miraculous capability of awareness, of mindfulness. Now, I'm gonna say something that you might think is ridiculous. Okay, laugh if you must. I'm saying it more for me than for you. This cosmic intelligence that we are talking about is not Jewish. No, God is not Jewish. We know that, yes. Nor is Jewish blood redder or more special than that of any other people. And beyond the Jewish worldview, let's go beyond. I doubt that we homo sapiens are quite as famous in the universe as we might imagine, apart from Hollywood, of course. From time to time, we may need a reminder that our narcissistic little species tends to fall back into pre-Copernican thinking, viewing ourselves at the center of the universe. So why Judaism? If God isn't Jewish, why Judaism? What's all the fuss about? And why all these words and the names and all these er elaborate rituals? Perhaps they are all to point to this vast, vast cosmic drama and more than point to it to remind us, to remind us to phone home. While the universe may outsize us, we do have something immense planted inside of us, that encoded chimp, 
Do you remember that we discussed on, on Rosh Hashanah, right? Embedded in each and every one of us that when all else fails, we get zinged back into line, sometimes through enormous pain and struggle until we remember, oh yeah, ooh, oh yeah, there's something bigger than me and I'm part of it. I'm, oh yeah, I'm a crystalline fractal of the whole that gives me the capacity for waking up, the capacity for cosmic consciousness if I can only get out of my way. The Kabbalah tells us that we each arrive into this world with the letters of God's name inscribed, engraved in the light, in light on our foreheads. Only the very clear-sighted or holy can see these Hebrew letters shining, like the saintly Rabbanit Shar Abi from Jerusalem of blessed memory, like the saintly Rabbi of Zlotshev. He would fix his gaze upon your forehead and tell you the flaw in your soul and how to heal it also. Our God letters can become distorted, almost unrecognizable as we make our way through this life. Which brings us back to what we are doing here tonight. What are we doing here on Yom Kippur? We are remembering, we are reconnecting, we're polishing our God-given letters, but we're earthlings after all, and we use bad judgment, and that's how we learn good judgment. By the times we, but the times that we forget to phone home, to reconnect with our hearts and through our hearts to our cosmic identity can be scary and lonely and dark. And this is the story of the four-year-old who I think you know the story. He insists on being alone with his newborn sister. One day he locks himself in the room with his infant sibling. His parents stand anxiously at the door and hear him saying, quick, Rosie, tell me about heaven again. I'm starting to forget. We're here to remember heaven. We're here to peel away, circumcise, the Torah says, the layers around our hearts to reconsider our careless treatment of ourselves, the negative effects that we have on others, on our world. All of that clutter, it clutters our divine connection. Our divine connection requires regular purification, which is what we are doing here tonight. <clears throat> you know, people say to me all the time, you're a rabbi, but isn't Judaism like so, I don't know, patriarchal? so outdated? How do you stand it? Or they'll say, Judaism, so dualistic, I'm so over that. You still believe in that stuff? They'll look at me kind of coyly. It's true, it is true, the words and the prayers are ancient, and yes, they're full of mind traps that can leave us small. And the words and prayers are so holy, also at the same time. It all depends on where you're coming from and how you say them. Once upon a time, 2,000 years ago, pre-Hubble, pre-Einstein, pre-Freud, pre-Betty Friedan, our leaders attempted to name the cosmic mystery. The rabbis had no telescopic lenses, no satellite photos. They knew in their kishkas how vast the mystery was. They experienced how vast it was. In those days, the most awesome metaphor was, I'm looking to you, are you there? What was the metaphor that we use all through Rosh Hashanah? God is king, who exacts justice, who looks at us one by one, who sees through our masks and armor, who plants his name on our forehead before sending us into time and space and can see what we have done with them. Calling God king was the ancients' way, our ancestors' way of putting a face and a form on the cosmic marvel of karma. This Yom Kippur, yes, this Yom Kippur, we didn't do it on first day of Rosh Hashanah, we will sing Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, and the familiarity and the beauty will make our hearts open because it holds all the deep emotion and the tears of generations, yet, we know that our Bubbies and Zadie's words addressing an anthropomorphic male king as his lowly, worm-like subjects only go so far. 
that dualistic and gender unneutral model simply doesn't encompass the living, breathing, vast world of which we are each and every one cells of the body. In the now many years that I've been talking to people about God, I notice how we struggle with the mystery, how we struggle to name it. The G word is way out of vogue. Do you notice how you say the word God and people just roll up their blinds and go away? Instead, I hear the word universe, as in, what does the universe want of me? What's what you put out into the universe? Because that's what you'll get back. How we struggle to bridge the gap between our Hubble-inspired visions and our simple truths. Actually, the truth is, Judaism goes so much farther than most people think in its spiritual imagination. And there are many other names and other metaphors within our tradition. We just don't know about them. And they match that big worldview, like the name Shem Havaya, the yud heh vav -Hey, that, that means pure being, the source of pure being, beingness. Or the name Eheyeh Asher Eheyeh, I'm becoming that which I'm becoming. God is saying, I, I who am the universe, and beyond, I'm always expanding. You can't pigeonhole me. I am growing as we speak, expanding. The universe is infinite and still expanding. And for many of us, the cosmos is too far. Do you know? I just find God right here, pulsing in my veins, thumping in my heart. And this would be named Shekhinah, the pulse of the universe, right here in my body. So why am I saying all this? Because in our very secular and or Buddhist or non-dual or humanistic nature, culture, being here praying to an external God no longer makes sense. We can go on automatic, we can check our beliefs at the door or do it for old time's sake, but what's that really worth? It's only when we are authentic with ourselves and the words that we sing and know what we are facing, that any of this makes sense. The great Hasidic masters taught that God, the consciousness of the universe is not only alive, it is looking at us now. It has everything to do with the poem that Mary just read. And more, the consciousness of the universe needs us, they say. Bakshu fanai, God says, seek my face. Look for me. I come in so many forms and guises. I show up in the faces of your children. I show up in the face of your friends, in the face of tragedy, in the face of death. Above all, I show up in the face of kindness. You'll find me here in your heart. Bakshu Fanai, I formed you over 14 billion years so that I might be known, God is saying to us, see me. Feel me, touch me, heal me. The great who, the me of the universe wants and needs us. One Hasidic legend tells of the grandson of, the, of Rabbi Baruch of Medzibuz. The rabbi finds a little boy sitting under his desk weeping. He's crying. What is it, Mamala? What happened to you? Between his sobs, the boy explains, we were playing hide and seek and I was hiding here, but then they stopped looking for me and they just went, went along and went to another game without telling me. Tears brimmed in the Rebbe's eyes too. As, and he said, you know, God says the same thing. I hide, but no one comes to seek me anymore. So none of us can predict what this next new year is going to bring with it. We do know this though, the shape of our lives from global finance to politics, to earth, to climate change, to war, everything is changing rapidly and alarmingly. There are bound to be wild curveballs galore coming at us and we need a very strong container we need each other, and we need a way to phone home. 
Bakshufanai, seek my face. Just look, my face is everywhere, God says, on this side of the veil and that. And on this most sacred night of the year, we face into infinity. We face into our death. We face the still small child within us who has not forgotten the dimensions of heaven. Let it not be said of us in the 21st century when our earth is dying and the cry of the species grows louder and louder that we, the people of Havaya, pure being, the people of Eheya, the expanding universe, the people of Mother Shechina, let it not be said ever that we were stuck praying, praying to dead metaphors, to a tribal deity with words that don't soar and concern for our own numbers rather than the awe and the wow of the universe. Let it not be said of us that we are the frozen chosen, still enacting plastic rituals because we have hopelessly forgotten our home, the magical universe. But let it be said and let it be true of us that we stand facing the universe and expanding with it and into it, reaching for our limitlessness, seeking God's face in all things, in the eyes of our children, in the elements of this magical earth, and especially in each other. May the radiant face of the universe bless each one of us with life and a faith befitting the cosmos. Good yantif.